part of the transformation of Latin America by the left in the region since approximately 1998, when Hugo Chavez was selected. Obviously, there have been an enormous progress before made by the Cuban Revolution. And Venezuela and others took it from there. And although I don't have a great deal of time about this, if one were to look at the change position for the better of women in Nicaragua, women in Ecuador, women in Brazil, in Argentina, um, and so on. I don't have time to mention all the 35 countries, but certainly, particularly in the case of Bolivia, where 65 to 70 percent of the population in that country are indigenous and where the economy is made up particularly the economically active people um, there are 65 to 70 percent in the informal sector and it's primarily women i've seen that with my own eyes and when you look at the pictures of indigenous people marginalized impoverished and dignified, you know, on the sidelines, even in the center of towns. And when you see the role, the role of protagonists that they're playing today in all the magazines, in all the political, if, you know, not the political committees, parliament and so on. Bolivia, I think is one of the few countries in the world where 51% of the parliament is made up of women representatives, which is, you know, it's an indication and a great deal of them are actually indigenous. And just look at any newspaper in Bolivia and look at the pictures and you see how much progress they have made. So that's the first thing to celebrate about, you know, progressive governments in Latin America. Um, two more brief things. Number one, Venezuela is suffering enormously because of the huge amount of sanctions being inflicted upon its people by the United States. The Trump administration boasted, and still some of them do, of having imposed more than 300 sanctions against the people, which targeted their oil, targeted their gold, targeted their finances, targeted their trade, targeted medicine, targeted antibiotics, targeted even food, deliberately in order to ensure that this economy asphyxiated and the people were driven to desperation to such an extent that some kind of uprising out of desperation would take place, which would justify an external intervention, call that a military intervention by the United States and their allies in the region. This is not materialized because Venezuela is very well equipped in terms of you know, people's committees and people's militia and their own military equipment. So it's not an easy task to just go for it. Nevertheless, the harm and the damage that's been inflicted on the population is disgustingly high. Uh, between 2017 and 2018, 40,000 people in Venezuela die unnecessarily because of ailments caused by the shortages of medicine. You know, we're talking about pregnant women. We're talking about the chronically ill, we're talking about cancer patients, we're talking about these sort of people, the most vulnerable. And ever since then, uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur, who has been to Venezuela just a few days ago, a couple of weeks, one week ago, issued a very damning report denouncing the sanctions, saying that more than 100,000 people have died as a, as a consequence of the shortages. The worst part of this is Venezuela has huge amount of resources being illegally retained in European financial organizations, such as the Bank of England, such as Euroclear, such as the Novo Banco in Portugal, and few more, $6,000 million. Venezuela has the resources, has the money, the wherewithal, to be able to purchase the stuff, vital health input, and this is denied because they recognize this guy Guaido, and even the European Union that has stopped recognizing Mr. Guaido, the self-proclaimed president, still doesn't give the resources back to Venezuela because they're frightened that the United States might, might sanction them. And um, 
President Biden, who's kept very quiet about Venezuela, which is a good sign, we hoped, actually has just renewed the decree that declare Venezuela an extraordinary and unusual security threat to the national security of the United States, which is unbelievable. How does Venezuela represent an extraordinary and unusual you know, threat to the internal security of the United States? And as a result of that decree, the president declares the United States in a state of emergency, which technically means the United States is technically at war with Venezuela. So any self-defense action that it takes, um, you know, is totally justified and is legal. In other words, we may be able to avoid asking Congress for permission to go to war. We do not know whether they will do. I'm not trying to suggest that you know an invasion is going to take place tomorrow, but we expect the Biden administration to be a bit better, not because he's more progressive, but because he's more rational compared to Trump. Unfortunately, there are pressures at work, and this is the problem. So the only thing we can do is to continue resistance. And um, with the permission of uh, the chair and and um, look. I just want to say one more thing, if I may. We've made significant gains in Latin America in many ways, and these bodes well for the immediate future. Number one, Venezuela survived, but it's still very strong. The economy is slowly recovering. Um, we in Venezuela have enormously powerful allies internationally, namely China, Russia, and few other countries, certainly Cuba and so on. Nicaragua was an that attack also survived, you know, quite easily because they have a strong people's organization there. And then we were able to actually recover Bolivia where a good time 2019 had overthrown the progressive government there. And we came back in Bolivia and although in the election in 2019, November, the, our people got 48%, in this election in this year, um, sorry, in 2020, because if the whole thing was postponed by one year, they were subjected to horrible repression, racist attacks and so on by a racist government, de facto government. We won by 55%. So this changed the relational forces quite dramatically we had a referendum in Chile to change the neoliberal model, which is something that doesn't happen anywhere. And we got 77% in favor of the transformation. And this is going to be a constitutional you know, convention that is going to implement this change. We'll see how it goes, um, but it looks very good. It's another big defeat for imperialism and neoliberalism. And in Ecuador, we look like we're going to win the elections in the second round, which are going to take place on the 11th of April. So a great deal of good things are going to happen. And the United States is declining very badly. And our friends are going up very, very well. And we're still resisting well. And the relation of force is very traumatic. We've got progressive governments in Argentina and Mexico. So we're well in place to restart the pink wave of progressive governments in the region that look, took place between 1998 to 2014. Um, just one more sentence to finish. In that period, which was about 10 years, the level of poverty in Latin America declined from 44% to 26%. And as a result of about three to four years of neoliberalism, Poverty has gone up again to 33%. And this, this is 75 million people. And in the context of the pandemic, this is totally criminal that the sanctions have continued to be implemented and that the United States continue to destabilize our economy. Enough is enough. We need people like yourself to continue resisting because that is essential. So I finish with a Viva Latin America, Viva Venezuela. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Um, and Steve, if I can ask you, I know you're in the background. If there are no, um, if our other speakers are not here at the moment, maybe we can take a question or so for Francisco. 
I just like to point out that, you know, Caribbean labor solidarity, you know, we've supported the progressive left in the region, entire region from the time we've existed, which is over 40 years ago, and we continue to do so. Um, and, you know, Venezuela being declared a threat to the United States is not surprising because even Little Grenada was declared so and invaded as many of Caribbean people would remember. <laughs> It's not so much that the Americans see us as a physical threat, but it's our ideas and the things that we um, would like to see happening in our countries where the masses of people um, are considered before profits, um, where we try to institute programs and initiatives that would mean a real and true independence for people. Um, but instead, we are constantly threatened with our sovereignty in the region and it's in every island's interest and in every country in the region to defend Venezuela. Because if Venezuela goes, if their sovereignty is not respected, what chance have the rest of us got? Thank you very much again, Francisco, for being with us. Um, and Luke, I just, I think, uh, I think Jackie McKenzie uh, has joined us. Jackie has joined us. Available to speak when you wish to call her. Okay, Jackie, I shall be calling you in a few minutes. So yes, I just give you time to settle in. It's great that you're here. Thank um, you. Thank yes. you. Was there, was there any one question for Francisco? Steve, was there any? I haven't seen the chat. No? Sorry, my screen has gone blank. Hi, my name is Dr. Liz O'Cocon from London. Greetings, everybody. Um, um, the struggle continues. Um, thank you very much for the introduction there. Um, just to sort of solidarity with our Latin um, cousins and our Caribbean friends and brothers and sisters. Um, I really hope that under the new administration in America, um, we can start to make a difference in, the, in, the, in our Southern Hemisphere in general, um, especially politically. Um, I really um, was so impressed and inspired by um, what Cuba has been doing medically. We really need that um, in Britain. Um, talk about a Caribbean um, health ne network because we're, you know, fighting on our own in lots of different um, areas. And when you see how Cuba's got it together, can actually offer help to Italy and other places, we really need to, to um, all the effort and all the hard work that our Windrush um, allies and um, that have gone ahead of us, our heroes like my mom and my dads who came and helped to set the NHS up. So one thing that we can't rely on is the NHS. And um, we've been um, put in a position where we even can't trust their vaccine. We can't trust their, um, when we go into ITU. And, and that is even as healthcare professionals myself. So um, we need to um, certainly carry on working together and any um, joint workings with um, our Latin cousins and our Caribbean brothers and sisters I'm looking forward to, to getting involved in that. Thank you, everyone, and I look forward to this meeting. Thank you very much for your time. Is there, is there one minute that I... Yes, because okay. the, the issue that it was raised is extremely important from the point of view of what we can do. Literally one minute. Thank you very much for those words. The role that the Black leadership and Black organizations have played in the, in the defeat of Trump in the United States is gigantic, it's magnificent. And I think it, there lies a huge amount of hope because there is no question about it that their struggle for equality against racism, you know, links up with what we're trying to do in, you know, further south. So, any opening that we find in dialogue with these forces, which have played a magnificent, magnificent role, particularly somebody called Stacey Abrams in Georgia, who I, you know, take my hat off for her, because of her role in the struggle. And that is where I think we need to establish alliances. So you people are absolutely part of this central plank of our solidarity with our region to change, to continue changing the world. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out, Francisco. I think we will move on um, in a second to, uh, to introduce in Jackie. Um, but before I just, you know, because, you know, health is the issue being mentioned here, you know, we know the outstanding work that the Cubans have done. And I think 
when we saw the collaboration with Venezuela in terms of providing um, a million eye operations in the region. I mean, it was just something that is awesome that we should always, you know, never forget that, you know, with the right resources and the skills that Cuba has provided, Venezuela provided the resources at the time to make that possible for the region. Um, and it's, it's an example of what we can do um, in the future as, as more resources come forward. Okay, um, without much ado, I'd like to introduce now um, Jackie McKenzie. Um, Luke, can we take one more question? Okay, just a quick one, go on. Can you, can um, you ask the brother if there is a pan Latin American organization that covers the interests of the indigenous people? A pan, a pan Latin American organization that covers the interests of the indigenous people? Okay, Francisco, I'm sure you heard that. So can you come in quickly? Yeah, the the we have a I don't have time because there is a question on the on the chat. It's about state support. There are several representatives from the Democratic Party who have raised objections to the sanctions. And we hope that this grows. So we are working on that. We have two unions, other organizations, social activists, and so on, that you know are going, is, this is going this likely to continue to grow. Recently, the Bolivians organized um, a continental movement and in order to set up a continental organization to defend indigenous um, to defend indigenous people's rights, and this has been, just been established. There were links and coordinations before, but it's just been established. It includes, you know, indigenous people and different indigenous groups from every single Latin American country but also from the United States and Canada. And this is an extraordinary important development um, because we in Latin America cannot be fully democratic until their, their rights, their cultural rights and the respect for their dignity is complete in our own governments. And there is still a lot of room for improvement. I'll leave it there, comrades. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. It's good, it's good to hear that. It's good to hear that. Okay, can people continue any discussions in the chat and um, any information that people might want to put up that can be in the chat as well. So we don't have to um, be listened to at everything. Um, okay, let me, um, Jackie, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, Jackie's an international lawyer. She's been involved with CLS for a very long time. I used to describe her sometimes as a chief cook and bottle washer because she filled so many roles and kept this organization going for a very long time. I'm amazed at her energy and skill and the, the amount of work she's done with um, Caribbean Labour Solidarity. I'm especially proud to welcome you, Jackie, because I know you've been at the forefront in many ways in defending the legal rights and representing people who've been caught up in this Winrush scandal. Um, so without much ado, please, Jackie. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Lovely to see so many of you here on a Sunday. And Chair, thank you very much for that introduction. I've worked with Luke, I think, going back to 1982. So a very, very long time. I had the role of being CLS's treasurer for about 20 years. <laughs> we never had any money, so I never had any work to do. But uh, I still find in my attic every now and again an odd bank statement that says £1.90 or something. Um, Is that enough is that was that a plug for donations from <laughs> listeners thank you that's your much. that's your job but yeah um and i'm also pleased to see colleagues on here students um diplomatic corps from the grenada high commission and long-standing friends uh from uh cls days people like nadine uh here and also wonderful to see uh so many people who are actually affected by the Windrush scandal, Glenda, Anthony, etc. Um, so I was thinking that so many of you who would come to a meeting like this will already know much about the Windrush scandal, possibly more than me. For some of you, it's your lived experience. So it's a bit of a difficult one. Very often I'm giving these speeches in schools or, you know, or people's homes. I don't mean to sound derogatory, but, you know, I can't think of a better way to describe them. Um, or all over the place. And people aren't so engaged with the issues. And so I can go back through the history, the 
an attempt at the legislation, which is so complicated and where we find ourselves today. But I don't think this is a sort of audience who's going to need any of that. So I'm just going to do a quick whistle top store, uh, tour through what I think are the key issues and um, perhaps have it more interactive. There might be things about the Windrush scandal or the Windrush injustice that you've not seen covered anywhere and you might have a burning question, might not necessarily be able to answer it. I'm really pleased to see that there are Nadine and other lawyers on here who I might defer to if I don't know the answer. Um, so just to say that, um, you know, essentially I've picked up on the issues that we're now dealing with under the Windrush scandal going back some years. And I think the Dominica High Commission is also represented because in 2015, they asked me to do a training course for them. And that course was really to look at what was happening to people from the Eastern Caribbean countries. Mr. Sandy from the Grenada High Commission who's also on here was present at that course. Um, we were asked to look at the non-visa nationals who were turning up at various UK ports and being denied entry. So these were holiday makers who don't need a visa to come here and they were being denied entry for very, you know, um, ridiculous reasons, often because they had no cash on them, you know, sometimes business people who had gold Amex cards and so on, but because they didn't have any cash, they couldn't prove to an immigration officer that they were coming here for legitimate reasons um, and not wanting to overstay the six months that they were granted. We also um, found that the two countries that require, from, from the CARICOM region, that require visas, so they weren't having this problem, Jamaica and Guyana were having other problems. They were having a high incidence of refusals um, for people who were um, coming here with visas, uh, but being refused the visas. And then there's the perennial question of deportations and particularly how it affects Jamaica. The different CARICOM countries were having different problems and we came together in 2015 to look at how the diplomatic corps might use its, its influence as I thought they had then, although they keep telling me they don't have any influence over the British government, um, to try and get perhaps some change to practice and, and policies. Um, and one of the things that somebody brought up was the fact that what's happening with all these people who've arrived here from the 40s, the 50s, 60s and 70s, who are having to spend thousands of pounds to prove that they have the right to remain in the UK. And that was effectively the Windrush scandal. We didn't know of it then, we didn't describe it then. And I started to think back to my days when I was a solicitor at Bernberg Pierce, I think one of my colleagues, or two of my colleagues are on, um, I realized, you know, people were coming to us and we were simply going through the process of naturalization or no time limit stamps or applying for indefinite leave to remain. And whereas it sort of occurred to me, why should, you know, my parents' generation be having to fork out so much money for this? We hadn't really clocked that it was an issue. And it's one of the reasons why, in the scheme of things, the Windrush scandal isn't as bad as it could be. It's bad politically and ideologically, but it is, and obviously for the people who were affected, but in terms of the numbers, it isn't as big a scandal as people originally thought it would be when those stories first started hitting the press. And it's because most people who come from the countries affected by the Windrush scandal want to go back home on a holiday or bring their children there. And to do that, you have to get some sort of document. And so they spent the thousands of pounds and uh, naturalized or, or, or got some other document um, that said that they uh, had the right to come back. And it's the people who couldn't do that for a whole manner of reasons. I mean, clients that I'm working with, sometimes it was simply because when they applied, the name on their birth paper didn't match a name on another document. And so they were refused. Some people didn't know that they had to do it, et cetera, et cetera. But the scandal has actually been around for a very long time. And some people would argue that the scandal's actually been around um, since 1948, you know, when that boat docked, because it's always framed in the context of the ship, although it hasn't really got much to do with that whatsoever. Um, so we had this um, training session and we were starting to see these huge numbers of people coming through. And it wasn't until The Guardian, uh, mainly, but then other media picked up on this, started to produce all those stories. Mr. Sylvester in November 2017, who had been denied cancer treatment, 
um, and then all the stories that we saw in the spring of 2018, which really brought um, the matter alive. And the historical uh, perspective to this is changes in immigration and nationality law going back to the 60s mainly. I, I did see a presentation by one of my colleagues who I think is in this session um, where he took it back to Roman times. Well, I haven't been able to do that level of research, but um, I started the 60s. I'm kind of okay with that. Um, and particularly the 1971 uh, Immigration Act, uh, which changed the status of people who had a right of abode or uh, what we call people who were uh, citizens of the UK and colonies. And then particularly the 1981 uh, British Nationality Act, which really brought us to where we're at today. And you might have seen the case in The Guardian this week, because there's one every week, isn't there, <laughs> of somebody, um, Trevor Donald, um, and he, who, who was kept out of the country by the state, wrongfully refused re-entry when he went to his mother's funeral in Jamaica. And he's come back and he's been given status, settled status, but been told, well, he can't have his citizenship back. Now, he didn't really have citizenship in the first place. So there's a whole complex problem of, you know, everyone saying they were British citizens and strictly they weren't because people lost the status without knowing, you know, by a sleight of hand. Um, Francis Weber, who uh, from the Institute of uh, Race Relations, who, who's also a colleague, a former colleague of Nadine's from Garden Court Chambers, um, wrote a really interesting paper on this and did a seminar for me with home office lawyers to look at this. And uh, she actually said, you know, how can you strip somebody off their status without telling them? You know, if you've got to renew your uh, car tax or your driving license, you get a letter reminding you to do that. But these citizens or these people uh, from Commonwealth countries, particularly black Commonwealth countries who were settled in the UK got no such thing. There was a change in the law which affected them and most of them didn't know. And that's how we arrived at where we're at today. But for most people, there was no real issue. You know, if they didn't want to travel, they didn't have an issue until we ended up with, um, the hostile environment and I'm always intrigued by the hostile environment because the first time it was ever mentioned was by Liam Byrne, Labour Party minister. <laughs> he was the first person to talk about wanting a hostile environment. So I know Liz, Dr Liz and people on here from the Labour Party, that's something that you need to address um, with your colleagues because it is very much a left and a right issue, this way you know migrants are treated both groups are as bad as each other for different reasons but arriving in the same place whether it's the conservative wanting to appease the blue rinse or labor wanting to appease the red wall where we get to is a very severe and fierce anti-migrant imposition it might not be ideologically in the hearts of the left but you end up in the same place and we all heard the stories from our parents of the lack of white working solidarity with them when they arrived during the Windrush era and the problems um, in trade union movements. And a lot of people believe that those problems persist today. Um, and that being one of the reasons you're seeing all this chatter now on social media about the need for black trade unions, which I think is an unfortunate chatter, but is informed by uh, a recognition that that solidarity isn't in there in the way it should be. But we are gonna be fair to Labour and accept that it wasn't really them who brought in the hostile environment, although they used the, the phrase. We really saw it in two, well, it was in the Labour, in the Conservative Party manifesto in 2010 as an actual policy. Um, and then from 2012, when we had a whole series of changes in legislation, July 2012, um, we really saw it coming to the fore. Um, where almost everybody in society became an immigration enforcement officer. You know, schools, I get calls from nurseries asking me whether a child was entitled to be in the nursery because they didn't understand the parents' immigration status um, and universities, uh, doctors, and that's why, you know, you saw the few medical cases where people had been denied treatment, uh, housing officers, although that came slightly later with the right to rent policy, um, and so on. Um, and in particular, employers, because employers were being charged 
uh, well, fined rather, uh, £20,000 if they employed somebody who didn't have the right status documents. And so employers were going through their files and looking to see what they had. And if they had a nurse on, you know, who'd been with the NHS for 30 years, as is a case, a real case, and she couldn't show that she came here in the 60s and had all this documentation, they sent her home. And that is how this problem came about. You know, we put the onus of proving everyone's status on, on ordinary people up and down the country, some who feared that they would be penalized if they didn't do the right thing. And I think others who probably just wanted to get rid of difficult staff and used it, um, because I've seen a lot of that too, when going through the records of what, you know, when we get the subject accesses from employers in trying to help people with their Windrush compensation. But we saw that big uh, series of cases, mainly through the work of Amelia Gentleman at The Guardian, but also more lately, people like Diane Taylor and uh, May Bullman in The Independent. And, you know, it's quite sad, really, for me as a black woman, because I told The Voice about this before the story became prominent. And they did absolutely nothing with it. You know, they, either they didn't understand it or they just couldn't care less, is my view. It could have been their break. However, People say to me, had a black journal broken this story, it might not have got the traction that it got, such as the society we live in. And that, who knows, that's an unfortunate possible truth. Um, so we have the scandal. And as it turned out, the um, Caribbean prime ministers happened to be in the UK for the Caricom heads of government meeting, Chogham. And they said, and very interesting, you know, because the ones that were really exercised by this, Jamaica in particular, because Jamaica even now has the largest number of people affected by the Windrush scandal. The top four countries are Jamaica, Ghana, Jamaica, Nigeria, Ghana, and Barbados, but Jamaica way out ahead for all sorts of historical reasons, which would be subject of another discussion because that's very interesting in its own right. Um, and, and it was interesting to me because Theresa May said, you know, well, you know, she, she was very combative and very assured that she hadn't done anything wrong, even though the hostile environment was really ratcheted up under her um, and refused to meet with them. Um, and uh, but what you had were her allies, because remember, Jamaica, Antigua and Grenada are the three CARICOM countries that are members of the International Democratic Union, which is a right wing organization. And they were allies of hers. Um, and I happen to know only because I had to take the Grenada prime minister to channel four because he was going to talk on, um, on the death of one of my clients who was Grenadian, Dexter Bristol, who was the, one of the early deaths attributed to the Windrush scandal. Um, and uh, and I, so I was able to get a little bit of insight and also from Mr. Sandy, who's here, as to what was going on. And they actually went off for a dinner with uh, Theresa May. And then you heard that incredible impassioned speech or credit to him, despite his ideological stance on these issues and the fact that we can't get much movement on him on deportation. We have to give him the credit for making that very, very powerful speech um, Andrew Holness, which caused the government to finally sit up if their own allies are, you know, are, 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 are condemning them, they uh, stood up and set up the Windrush Task Force. And the Windrush Task Force, very quickly, because uh, I don't want to go too long, the Windrush Task Force um, was set up to do two things. It was set up by the Home Office to um, deal with compensation, um, and hardships, I put compensation and hardship together, although the hardship bit of it doesn't work, we call it the hardly fund rather than the hardship fund, because very few people have had any success in getting anything out of it, and you can't imagine the rudeness and, and, and the obstruction you get from the people there, you know, you would have seen in the news the case of Chiplin Burton, who was stuck in Jamaica for many years, wrongly, and when she came back at Christmas, you know, the Home Office brought her back, and she asked for 500 pounds to get some winter clothing. And I wouldn't have believed this if, if I hadn't been copied into the email by the Hardly Fund team said, well, what do you mean by warm clothing? Yeah, um, you know, these are people you've hurt and you're going to speak to them in this manner. It was absolutely disgraceful. Vernon Van Riel, the boxer, I'm only mentioning cases that are already in the public domain before anybody reports me to any regulator. Um, the, the Vernon Van Riel case where, you know, he'd been a champion boxer 
in the UK, came back. We saw the photos of him living in virtually a disused shop, which was tantamount to a hut, no electricity, no, no, no amenities whatsoever. And he came back and a boxing club somewhere said, well, you can come and spar with our young people. Um, and he came back with a, with, a, with a medical complaint and the Home Office wrote this very long letter to him and to me saying, we don't think, because he wanted a hundred pounds to get some boxing paraphernalia. They wrote saying, we don't think you should be doing this. Um, we don't think you're well enough, you know? And we want medical evidence. Like, I mean, as if it was anything to do with them. You know, treating the Windrush generation uh, with, with, with contempt. I mean, the Home Office always pulled me up on that word because they say, they, they, I actually appeared on a radio program and used the word and they listened in on the program or they get the transcripts, I think, their media monitoring department because they keep telling me all things that they've heard me say. And they actually rang me to ask me if I truly believe that they're treating people with contempt. And I say, yes, you are treating people with contempt and you still are treating them with contempt. And we've seen so many cases. Joyce Lynn John, who was stuck out in Grenada wrongly, very, very awful case because she's somebody unlike a lot of the Windrushers, who was able to prove that she had been in the country from 1968, she supplied 75 pieces of evidence to the Home Office before they gave her removal directions for Christmas and she left in a panic. And when she got to Grenada, she was homeless. She was put up with, at a women's refuge who could only house her for a little while. Um, and in the end, when she left, really terrible things happened to that woman. She hasn't told the full story. So I would leave you to think of, use your own imagination, but unspeakable things happened to her because she was vulnerable, suggestible and virtually homeless. Um, and they brought her back to an empty flat. She was housed by the council, um, had lost everything. And then they, she asked for some money from the Hardly Fund for a cooker. And they told her to look on Gumtree and get a second hand one. Um, so that's the sort of stories, you know, and there are loads of them. There are hundreds of them, um, but we, we don't have time to go into them. But that's the sort of thing that we've been dealing with from the Hardly Fund. Mm -hmm. On the status document side, um, 13,000 people have managed to get some sort of status. M settlement, about half settlement, about half um, citizenship. Uh, there are some judicial reviews. I, I have got the details of the judicial reviews if anybody wants them. I can't because I just suddenly realise I'm, I'm going over my time, so I'm not going to go into them. But one of them that's brought by a colleague of mine who's online on, in this meeting is an interesting one because he wants the status of people who are in the country for five years before the 1st of January 1983 um, to be uh, remedied. Uh, and, and, and to be given back their CUKC status, so they can avail themselves of British citizenship automatically under the British Nationality Act. Um, and he also wants a reparative act for justice, which I'm gonna, it's gonna be my last point in a minute. Um, there is also a JR about a judicial review rather about children who aren't being, uh, aren't allowed uh, to avail themselves. You will probably be aware that the Windrush scheme only goes up to 1988 and you've actually got uh, adults who came, but they're the children of the Windrush generation who came after that date or who were already 18 and they're falling outside the scheme. And there's a brilliant little organization called Movement for Justice who are doing quite a lot of work on that. There's also the issue of criminality, you know, the Home Office saying that they're not going to give citizenship to anybody who's got criminal uh, convictions. So by applying the current uh, uh, restrictions on grants and citizenship to criminal uh, to people with criminal convictions in the way that you would do ordinarily, totally ignoring um, the fact that a lot of these convictions came after these people would have been able to avail themselves of the status anyway. And so it's really complicated, but there are judicial reviews flying around and the Good Law Project. Uh, I have some issues with what they're wanting to do, but we are looking at it and working with them. So. But generally speaking, people are getting their, their documents, not necessarily the right documents, I think. There's also the issue that they're all being having to give their biometrics. We're very disturbed by that. The biometric card that they're being given is for 10 years, and these are elderly people. So we're wondering, well, what happens if they don't remember to do something in 10 years time? Are we likely to have another scandal? There's also um, this, this big problem, as I said, about people who are completely outside of the scheme, uh, returning residents, for instance, particularly from, from West Africa, the numbers of them who should be protected by the 1971 Act, but another piece of legislation is being applied to them um, and, and they're being uh, refused re-entry. 
uh, so, so, the, 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 so, so it's problem. But the other big problem is that the Home Office and our trawl around the High Commissions and the work we've been doing with the High Commissions kind of tally up. We They, they say there should be about 50,000 people based on census data who should have been able to avail themselves. So these are people who come from the, the relevant countries on the list who have no status document um, and they were able to glean that from the 2011 census. We've got another census next week, so it'd be interesting to see what when we get those results. Um, and only 13,000 have availed themselves of these documents. And, you know, the Home Office is saying, well, what's happened to the rest? Now, of course, you know, there'll be the percentage margin for error, and there'll also be those who've died or migrated or not interested. I actually do meet people who aren't interested at all. They said, well, they've lived for 50 years without it. They're not bothering now. But one of the issues is actually that people are frightened to come forward because we have a Home Secretary who's continuing to speak tough, on these issues, on migration issues. I mean, she issues an apology one minute and then deports a whole plane load of Jamaicans the next. Or, you know, she talks about sympathy on one hand and then, you know, she wants to blow small boats out of the channel the next day. Or, you know, she's having a go at lawyers or, or whatever. You know, it's just hostile. It's, it's hostile upon hostile. And so people are thinking they don't believe, they don't trust, they don't believe her that they can come forward and avail themselves. So it's really problematic. We have a lot of work to do. We, before lockdown, were doing outreach into centers of influence to try and find people and say to them, you've got to avail yourselves. So very, very few people have come forward. Um, and then you've got this compensation scheme and you've probably seen all the articles in the media. And I know Glenda Caesar is online here today and her case has been covered very well. I mean, shocking, shocking treatment. Um, we gave evidence to the Home Affairs Committee on the 9th of December, I think it was, and on the 14th of December, Pretty Patel announced sweeping changes. So we have got somewhere um, with that. Um, and it was, I don't think it was just down to us. There was obviously lots and lots of advocacy groups and individuals and so complaining about the scheme. But I certainly think, you know, I mean, the, lo the lower end of the compensation for your impact on life was £250. I mean, what kind of impact on your life could be valued at £250? Um, and there are hundreds of issues that we could pick up with the scheme, but I keep looking at Luke's face to see if he's going to tell me to shut up in a minute, because so, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's yeah. one person I can see in, in, in my view. Um, so um, so, so we, we've got problems, but we've had some, some successes on that. What we need to do now is to encourage more people to come forward there are still lots of problems there's lots of problems about putting people back remember you know some some mean people have said well why are they always going on about compensation this isn't really a compensation scheme it is about reimbursing people for what you have caused them to lose you know their employment their pension pension contributions savings people had to cash in pensions early to live you know i've got clients in that boat i've got clients who cashed in you know people always think oh it's a downtrodden group of people i've had clients who've had to cash in bonds and there is one client who stuck out in ghana had to sell his home here prematurely so you get all manner of stories in the windrush scandal that aren't very evident from how the media uh, portrays the story um so just finally you will have seen the, the wendy williams review um which is quite damning and her 30 recommendations her review is mainly about the culture of the home office and as i said we miss, uh, when we look at that, and I was part of that, I was on the independent advisory group, and I think a lot of work was done, hundreds of people were interviewed, you know, Wendy did an excellent job, but I think one of the problems, though, is that it doesn't deal with the ideology, the governments and parties get away quite, you know, easily on this, I think, we deal mainly with um, with, with the with the Home Office and their culture. Um, but we also need to look at the ideology. And just to tell you, I, you know, I was quite surprised. I've just had I've just had an article published about two days ago in the Discrimination Law Journal, which is a critique of the Windrush Lessons Learned. It's not a criticism of it, it's a critique. And I look at how, because it failed to meet, or it failed to say that uh, the Home Office had been institutionally racist because, you know, there were these sophisticated little definitions coming from the late Matt Ferson from his work and, and the Equalities Act uh, in terms of what assessment you could carry out and how you can conduct it. So there were all these little nuances and we couldn't therefore find 
uh, that things fit neatly into it. But, you know, Wendy Williams did find that there were tenets of racism. And if you've got tenets of racism, you've got racism in my mind. And so I've had this article published, which I can put a link to up in the chat afterwards. Um, but the reason why I say that the ideology is very important is because, um, you know, when you look, and I mentioned the Red Wall issue earlier on, when I, I was quite shocked when going through some of the, the old records, parliamentary records on this for some other work that I'm doing, I found that a, a, a document, a letter that had been written by 11 Labour MPs on the 22nd of June 1948, the date that the Windrush ship was docked out. It hadn't quite come into Tilbury yet. And it was a desperate letter uh, to Anthony Eden saying, look, don't you can't let this boat come in here. Uh, you know, um, we're going to have racial disharmony uh, uh, and all that sort of thing, you know, basically keep Britain white as Churchill, you know, <laughs> Paul Gilroy referred to Churchill in his There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack uh, book, um, that sort of thing. And I was shocked because I was reading this letter and I, I, I was flabbergasted because my history is not that great of that era. And I thought it was a it was conservative um, MPs who and then I'm thinking, but no, Labour was in fact, it was 11 Labour MPs who wrote that letter. And for a while, would you believe, Eden actually considered it. And so the boat was held up in the docks. And he was considering whether it should be turned around. Remember, that these weren't enslaved people on this boat. You know, these are free men and women on it who'd come here on the invitation. And he considered turning the boat round and sending it to East Africa for them to work on a British peanut farm. And that's documented in parliamentary records, Hansard, Kew Gardens, wherever you want to look, there's lots and lots of references to it. So that's the sort of thing that people were greeted with. And it's one of the reasons I think why those documents, you know, they keep saying the landing cards were destroyed. I mean, I, I'm a bit suspicious. I think they weren't destroyed. I think they're there. This isn't the country that destroys anything. Um, I think they're there. They just didn't want to make it easy for people to prove when they came. Um, although you can just go on ancestry.co and find it. I found the boat my father came on the... H.M. Georgic in 1951. I was quite shocked to just find that. So, you know, the Home Office would have had a problem there if they were really trying to, 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 to do that. But if they did destroy them, um, they destroyed them because, as Churchill had said, these people aren't coming here for long. They're coming to help with the post-war reconstruction and then we want them out. We want them back. They'll have gained some skills. They might have earned a little bit of money and we want them out. There was never any intention that my parents, my grandparents were going to be permanent citizens of this country. And in many ways, um, we still aren't. And I think I will just end by saying that um, I'm going to skip everything that I've written down here. And I'm just going to end by saying that the condition that the Windrush generation find themselves in today um, that caused the issues that Black Lives Matter and the organizations that work with Black Lives Matter are raising are still very pertinent 70 odd years on. And we see all these massive disparities in all the indicators of attainment and measurement, whether it's education, access to criminal justice, entrepreneurship, we saw it with health more recently with COVID, the disparities with COVID, the disproportionate uh, uh, imposition of it on certain communities uh, for all manner of reasons, comorbidities possibly, but poverty too. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, I fell out, I keep falling out with people, but I fell out with the Windrush um, day celebra celebrants um, when I said, no, no, we want to march. We want to go on march. We don't want to have tea parties on the street with buntings and fairy cakes. We want to march on Downing Street. Um, Downing Street and they were saying to me no 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 we have to celebrate the Windrush generation and so there was so we put on we did both and I tried to go to both but I was thinking well what on earth are we celebrating you know how what, what, what are we representing and so I want to say as my final point that the whole issue about the Windrush scandal is posited within these stories of people who came and people who were affected by the lack of status documents it's posited within a narrative or a discourse of compensation, which is really reimbursement, but where it really should be, and we haven't begun that conversation yet adequately, it should be posited within a discussion about restorative and reparative justice across the community, not just the handful of people who are affected as important as getting justice for them is. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much, Jackie. That was very powerful and, um, and covering so many issues. You know, I don't know where to begin, but it's great that you've touched so much on the political, the economic, the practical stuff that is being done, the legal the information you've given out. I'm sure people are bringing with, with questions for you. Um, I'm surprised that they would have, um, that they would challenge you about them being treated with contempt. <laughs> you know, when you think about, you know, the way in which they have treated people. Um, I spoke at um, a Windrush meeting that we organized about three years ago. And I linked the where the hostile environment um, operated and the, the, the roots of it really is grounded in slavery, um, because it's no it's not much different in terms of the way in which they've just torn family apart without any feeling, without any um, acknowledgement that you know these people have human connections that they would want to maintain. And so I've linked the way they've treated people today is grounded in the whole experience of slavery. And this is why this experience will continue and continue unless we interrupt it in very powerful ways. And I think you ended on the Black Lives Matter. And in some ways, you know, that is the future for us in terms of organizing around saying that we matter. The Black Lives Movement um, has put this issue again, not only in the UK and in America, but all over the world, we see people rising up and doing things and tearing down statues and saying, no, nope, we've had enough of this racism. There's still much for us to fight for, and but we've got to have the information. And clearly, um, we've got to be steeped in the knowledge of our history and the mistreatment that's gone on in the past and that continues to this day. Um, I could go on for, for, for much more on this, but I want to bring in people. I'm sure there's lots of questions that will be coming forward. And I'm sure, Jackie, you will stay with us to deal with some of those. I'm sure you didn't get to cover everything. Um, and But I, I also wanted to just touch briefly on the trade unions because I think um, when I came into this country, clearly there was, you know, a lot of people felt that the trade unions weren't representing black people as well as they might be. But I do want to think and feel that there's some shift and there's some changes happening. I've been invited to meetings because, you know, if you notice our name, Caribbean Labor Solidarity. We try to be aligned with labor as much as possible. And, um, and many unions have actually um, raised questions about the wind rush, raised questions about reparations, which is the other issue that we've got to be fully supportive of, unless the British government and the colonial governments that exploited Africans for profit make an apology and make reparation, nothing will change. And I think, you know, we've got to be prepared for this long haul, for this long fight, for this um, demand that we be paid reparations. And part of that, about that apology that is needed, that we know that they're actually beginning, they even take their racism um, and the abuse they've inflicted on us seriously. Okay, I, I'll stop there and I'll start to, thank you very much again, Jackie. I, I look now for, for questions. Steve, you can help me if you feel like. I'm just gonna look on the chat and try and pick up um, the first questions that have come true for Jackie. Um, so we could have some order. I, I think I did spot a few. Um, but I start with, um, I think there was one from Dennett. There I know. Uh, there we go. Question to Jackie. Um, okay. Let me just put this question, this question to you, Jackie. Is it true that under the 1981 British Nationality Act, a person born after the effective date of the law coming into force, whose parents were not British, then they too were not British? If this is true, what is the status of such persons in the hostile environment? Yeah, um, that, that is, so from the first, that, that bit of legislation was enacted on the 1st of January, 1983. So from that date onwards, um, although it is the 1981 legislation, it's not, they're, they're, they're not British automatically, but if their parents had indefinite leave to remain, um, then they're entitled to be registered as British. Um, and there are other schemes. So if a child was born here um, and their parents had no status, but child gets to the age of 10, um, then they're entitled to apply to be registered as British citizens as well. Um, so you will see, I don't know if you did see, but in the news just recently, there was a case, a successful case um, brought about the fees 
because it's one of the things that we try to get young people. There are lots and lots of young people. And when we're doing deportation work, we find people who could have availed themselves of registration and but didn't know or their parents couldn't afford the fees. Um, and so we're going with the mayor's office into once lockdown um, lifts, going into schools to give some talks. And um, I'm suggesting that we do a pamphlet or something to bring awareness uh, to this issue. Um, but the specific question is, yes, you are no longer automatically British if you were born after the 1st of January 1983 and your parents weren't. At least one of your parents has to have been or have indefinite leave to remain. Thank you very much, Sarah Jackie. Um, I'm just scrolling through the questions so I can get yeah. something. There, there is a, there, there a follow-up question um, there's lots of thank yous and, and, and everything. People are really appreciating the things you've said, but okay. We've got something then again from Dena. Landing cards are not supposed to be dis deposited with the National Archive, so they should be there. Note the records relating to the Mau Mau were destroyed only to be discovered a few years ago. Um, and I think you made the point earlier, Jackie, that you suspect the <laughs> There's some way they are not destroyed. We're not good there keeping records. And in some ways, that is very well on the reparations issue because we know exactly who's got how much and what and when. Um, and yeah, no, often when we are trying to help somebody, we do something called apply for a subject access request to the Home Office, and often you see landing cards in there. Um, and so it was just, you know, copies of them. And then we started seeing less so, you know, um, and, and more red acting. Um, I mean, I don't necessarily go in for conspiracies, but my view is that, you know, that the cards must be there somewhere. And in any case, so, so they're not, is absolutely correct. Um, they should be there in the archives, but there is other data available anyway that we've been able to use. As, as I said, we all discovered ancestry I don't want to give a plug to any commercial organizations and Caribbean labor solidarity. Um, but, you know, I have no affiliations with ancestry.co.com and there are probably others. Um, but um, we've been able to get quite a lot of data from them, actually. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. For that. <laughs> okay, we've got two hands up, Steve, you're telling me. Um, if you can let the first hand in um, to speak, if they have a question for Jackie, that would be great. Yes, Steve? First of all, Liz and someone called Liz with no surname, and then Dr. Liz uh, Okokun. You will have to, uh, you will have to unmute yourself before you can speak. Liz first. Hey, hi. Hello. 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 Everybody. I let Liz. Hello. Go on, Liz. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Jackie, um, my question is around people who you mentioned about um, those who were wrongly. Um, removed under the Windrush scheme, and you mentioned about um, if they have a criminal record that they were ex being excluded for the, from the scheme to come back. If I understood correctly, so have you have you come across such cases? And if so, um, what have what has been done in those cases where people may have been removed, but um, but they may have a criminal conviction and they would fall under the Windrush Windrush scheme? Hi, Liz. So I haven't seen any cases of people being uh, refused re-entry to the UK. What we're seeing instead is people... So, um, and you will know that um, if you've got criminal convictions or even bankruptcy, um, it can be a fetter to you getting citizenship. You know, bankruptcy, you have to have been discharged for 10 years, uh, criminal convictions, 15 years. Um, so, so, so ordinarily, um, those things exist. That's in the rules. Um, so the Home Office have been trying to apply this to members of the Windrush generation. Um, we've been fighting it on the basis that a lot of the convictions are, you know, for stuff that people wouldn't possibly get a conviction for today. Um, it's not coming up so much because a lot of the convictions are minor ones and are being spent, but we have got, so I was working with somebody who's got 42 convictions, um, you know, so he's been refused citizenship on the basis of what's called um, good character. That, that's the, the thing that's used to deny them. Um, and Duncan Lewis solicitors are bringing a judicial review on that. They're challenging that. Actually, sorry, it's not them. It's um, Dayton Pierce Glynn 
are, are bringing that traditional review. D Duncan Lewis is doing something else. Um, because it's wrong. Um, one, you know, people would have been entitled to the status before they got citizenship. Um, or two, a lot of the uh, criminal convictions are for very minor things. We have also seen, though, um, situations where the Home Office are in, they're, they're inconsistent because I've got cases where people have got serious criminal convictions and they've been granted it. So they're not um, uniform across the board. I'm not quite sure on what, uh, what basis they're doing things. Now, the Home Office are saying that they're bound to do it because the law says it. So they look at the legislation and, and often the law does say that they can do that, but they also have a discretion. It will be mad if any executive hasn't got a discretion and it's got a discretion because it's the executive it's also got a discretion uh, under human rights mm -hmm. legislation to do things and we see that discretion being exercised all the time i mean we saw it with the last big deport charter flight that was going to jamaica or scheduled to go to jamaica just before the lockdown um where children of uh children or, or so we've been having this argument and a campaign that anybody who's been in the uk from a very early age should not be deported. This is their country. They've learned their offending here. They shouldn't be deported. That's a separate issue. And the Home Office in cases that I've been involved in, particularly a very high profile one, which we lost to Kweku um, when the uh, you know 71 MPs wrote supporting him and 40,000 people signed a petition. And we met with the immigration minister at the time, which was Caroline Noakes. And there seemed to be at one stage, that's sort of like the 12th hour because of his MP, MSP, uh, Hannah Bardell from Scotland, um, had pushed so hard and we seem to have got somewhere on one day. And then the next day we got this letter saying, sorry, we just looked at this and we can't use our discretion, so we can't do anything, the law says. Um, but then we saw with the Jamaica deport flight where they took off the names of the list of children, of people who had been here as children. Um, so that was discretion. So, you know, um, it, it's, an, it's inconsistent, but what the Home Office seem to be doing, as we see with the Trevor Donald case in The Guardian this week, saying, sorry, it's the rules that we cannot give you citizenship because you've not lived here for the last five years, even though that was down to them, that he hadn't lived here for the last five years, and we've seen them do it in other cases, as I said. Um, we're saying you're going to have to use your discretion in these cases too, or, pass some remedial legislation, which is what they did to bring in the Windrush compensation scheme and also the fact that people can get naturalization for free. So they do it on the one hand and they don't do it on the other. It's totally um, inadequate. It needs to be sorted out. Um, but Liz, specifically, um, we've not seen anybody kept out. And in fact, some of the people who have come back in did have criminal convictions. Um, the issue is, are they going to be given citizenship and so far, they've not. They've been given settlement instead. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, uh, I notice uh, Dr. Liz Okadon, uh, Okakon, sorry, uh, uh, NHD Consultants and Calwinda Sandu. Perhaps you might want to take those three together and then Jackie could answer them. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Um, thank you, Jackie. Um, just trying to find my camera, see if I look decent, um, because I've got all these lovely elders on here. I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so Jackie, thank you very much. I've put some comments in the um, chat as well. Um, specifically, um, we've had these discuss discussions about the Labour Party repeatedly. Um, and we, what we're finding is that Black people in the Labour Party have often been as impacted as un, have not had as much power as we thought they have. They're as powerless as Obama was when he was president of the United States. So just being um, president of the United States doesn't give you any power. And sadly, it seems that being a lawyer doesn't seem to give you any power either. I was on the call with you and Gus Jones the other, Johns the other day. As trade unionists, we often feel that we have um, a right to recall through the Equality Act for when we're treated, mistreat, um, treated less favorably under the Equality Act 2010 and the um, Equal Pay Act and, all the, and the Health and Safety Act, but they don't seem to apply. And um, whenever you try to use the law in the trade union movement, we found that the law is, um, is, um, is, is left wanting, we're left wanting from law. Um, but my, my, my question is now, I see you going into schools 
I think that's really important that we um, empower our young people so that this doesn't keep everything we do as black people, we seem to be re repeating the same treadmill. So the next generation um, and the, you know, the, the campaign group, um, Windrush, what they're called, you know, the campaign group with the young people, they're very good at talking about what is going to happen to our next generations. We can't let things carry on the way that we've suffered and, and just let things go. But I feel, and I'm wondering, um, is this going to be a, an opportunity for people to then um, arrest us? Or, <laughs> you know, I think we're still living in that fear that that hostile environment hasn't accepted its mistakes. And I think there'll still be victims um, out there who might have not paid a TV license or something and didn't realise, you know, my mum's 89, but she still wants to travel. And I'm, I'm literally petrified to apply for her. So, um, yeah, is it is it safe? <laughs> and by the way, you're one of those rebel, I take it you're one of those rebel campaigning lawyers that I'm pretty sort of found some, some disquiet with. So congratulations. She, she's a rebel, she's a rebel period, don't worry with campaigning lawyers. Um, and I, I think, you know, fear is certainly something that the government and uh, are wanting to use against us. And, the only way we can resist that is by organizing. I encourage people again to join CLS, join other organizations, because it's only by coming together. Um, I note the way in which the, the government actually dealt with the, I think it was the Shrewsbury group that um, prevented the one flight leaving for Jamaica. You know, they were on terrorism charges. You know, this is serious um, way act of terrorism coming from the government for people who want to stand up for decency and for rights. And we can't expect that we be treated any less. Bentley, I see your hand is up, but there's a few before you. So we will come to you in a minute. Um, Steve, you'll take note that Bentley Cunningham is trying to have a, get a word in. Um, but thank you very much, Dale, um, Liz, for the thing. I don't know if Jackie wants to respond to anything, please, Dale. I think Steve was suggesting that you take a few and I can just respond to them. Okay. If you want to do it that way, if you want, I mean, I can see yeah. that. Um, Maybe a bit. We might cover some of the same questions. So yeah, Halima's got her hand up. And Norma, I can see Norma's got, she's there as NHTD Consults. She's got her hand up. Okay. Steve, uh, can I suggest we take NHD Consult, then Kalwinda Sandu, then uh, Halima Hassan, uh, one after the other, and then Jackie could respond to those three. Right, and then if you don't mind, if you take Bentley Cunningham, he's had his hand up physically for a little while. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker to question to Jackie. NHD consultants. Yes, please let him speak. Thank you. Welcome. As you know, I'm more a political activist um, as, as well as a lawyer, etc. And even though. Very faint. Can you speak up a bit louder? Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? It's still very quite low. Have you got a, is your mic up full? Can't hear you at all now. You've muted now, you've muted. Can you hear me now, everybody? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, right, okay. So first of all, I'll repeat. Thank you very much, Jackie, for your very hard and stalwart work in respect to the Windrush generation. Um, I can hear that we've gone down the legal route, uh, we've gone down all sorts of other routes to get some kind of, of um, sort of justice for what has happened. But I believe, and is it not time that we actually changed tact and actually demanded that we have an amnesty for the Windrush generation, the original Windrush generation um, people that landed on the boat, really because they are aging. And in terms of aging, they are not going to be here, um, you know, to, to actually tell us their story. So as long as they get British citizenship, then therefore their children, their great grandchildren, grandchildren, etc, should be able to get citizenship. So my question to Jackie is well done for what you've done so far. But is it not time to change the tact and get even more political? Thank you. Was there another question? We said we take three. Thank, thanks very much for your question. I'm sure Jackie's considering it. Cal Calwinda Sandu, please. Thank you. Um, 
I've put something in the chat. My name's Kinsey Sandra. I'm a researcher at Coventry University, and I'm researching the Windrush scandal because there's very little uh, scholarship about it. And I think it's really important that stories are heard. My, my question to Jackie was something that has, has been brought to my attention, is where the, the children, a number of children in the same family, where some have got uh, citizenship through application, especially prior to 1971, and others haven't within the same family. So it's really interesting to me that the Home Office, and I don't know if you've come across cases like this, where the Home Office, although they've granted British citizenship to siblings who all came together to the country as children, um, but they are still demanding um, much, much um, documentation from the sibling who didn't manage for various reasons to get their um, status uh, sorted out. And I just wondered whether you've come across cases like that, because there would be very, very similar documents uh, if siblings from the same family came at the same time to this country. Can we just have Halima Hassan and then Jackie to answer, please? Um, thank you so much. Jackie, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on this call. I don't think you are aware that the strength and the positivity that you give us those that who are facing a lot of racism and what, campaigning along with you and other, and whether it's a Labour Party, it's a privilege and it's a powerful to have you in this room. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, there's a lot of, um, I'm coming across a lot of people that who are refugees, I'm a refugee migrant myself, that who are facing mental illness and, 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 and who went into prison. And because of that, they commit crimes. And now when one person has been deported, I had that conversation with you before, and they're, they're telling them that you can come back after five years, even though they grow up here and they had a, he had a European passport, Hollandese passport. Is there a chance? And what, what, what about those other people that who cannot fight, them, fight for themselves who've been removed, um, whether they have mental illness or, or have a refugee, um, not status at all? Yeah. Um, could there, is there any chance that you think they could win the case if we can fight for them? Okay, thanks. I'm all over the place with my questions, so sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, um, Jackie, can you come in now? And so the first question was from Dr. Liz. Um, I know you're an activist in the Labour Party, so hopefully these issues that you raise will continue to remain on the agenda. But is it safe? I think it is. Um, it wasn't because, you know, whilst the Home Secretary and I think then it was Sajid Javid was busy saying to everybody, you know, you've got nothing to fear just come forward somebody actually got arrested didn't they in uh, David one of David Lammy's constituents so um so there have been problems and and people saw that on the news and and panicked and I work with people who are frightened um to go for the home op to go to the home office um you know or to have any interaction with them at all so it is an issue and I'll, I'll link it with um Norma's question about amnesty, because, you know, lots of people have written to me about an amnesty. I think there should be an amnesty for something else. I think there should be an amnesty for people who've been in the country for a certain period of time. That's a very different thing. And that's what Boris Johnson himself was talking about when he was the London mayor. Um, but that's separate. But in terms of the Windrush, we don't necessarily need the word amnesty because they have rights. But I think it might also that feeling that people have that there's still a fear built in here you know they might think well even if I have done something wrong or not paid my uh, so so for instance what one of the issues I get is uh, a lot of some of these old chaps worked all their life cash in hand and <laughs> didn't ever tell HMRC you know and um this they said should we apply for compensation because you know um HMRC might come and take the whole lot of it and and when you look at what they would have earned so they're not tax evaders you know they're not Starbucks or anybody but you know when you look at their um earnings they probably wouldn't have paid any tax anyway um or very little they just didn't really know that they should go about things in a particular way so but you know they're all very fearful um and as I see as I say the most important uh, measure of that is this 
hostile language that we get from the incumbents and the fact that those who might be a little bit decent in there don't say anything they just leave pretty patel to go off on a frolic off her own and say the most vile thing that she can say day after day um so i i so liz is it safe i would say to people it is i would say that if people have if you know of anyone who's hiding and who can avail themselves of the windrush scheme and then eventually the Windrush compensation schemes, there's two separate things, Windrush schemes about documents, Windrush compensation schemes about money. Um, then maybe put them in touch with myself or lots of organizations around the country. They're all over the place. There's Preston, a group, wonderful group of women in Preston. There's a group in Manchester, Birmingham. If you just put the word Windrush groups or advocacy into Google, you will find somebody. The law centers are brilliant. Um, North Kensington uh, and Hackney have been doing incredible work um, with people. Um, there are lots of solicitors firms doing it. Um, I have, I mean, I have an issue with some of them in that they're charging 30% of people's Windrush compensation, which for me, and these are some of the good progressive firms, 25% I've seen, 30%. I've even seen one, a conditional fee agreement, and because I don't do conditional fee agreements, I didn't understand it, so I sent it to my colleague who works in a firm that does that to ask, what does this mean? Because I thought I must be reading this wrongly, and it was that the firm was going to take, and it's a big name firm, I won't, don't want to be sued, so, but a big name firm were going to take 67% of the person's compensation on a conditional fee agreement. Um, so there's some real horrendous things, and they are the civil liberties firms, so, um, you know, um, so so it's a big worry, but I'd say it's safe. Norma, you asked about amnesty, so I kind of dealt with the amnesty, and you, very important to bring up the point about the cohort aging, because I I know of about twenty people who have died. We just learnt of one this week who died of COVID, um, and you know, there's at least I don't know a dozen or so of these stories in the media of people who have died. But the Home Secretary just published her latest data on how many people have gone through which bit of the scheme and how much compensation has been paid and offered and accepted, you know, the usual data that we get that goes to the Home Affairs Committee and also the National Audit Office. Um, and I was shocked to see in there that there are 91 claims for estates. So for people who have died, now I don't know if they've died since the scandal came to, to light or whether these are people who died previously and someone thought well we should probably try and get a claim in and I don't know if they're viable claims because the home office gets lots of claims that they tell me are absolute rubbish you know they've got a hundred and so claims from one address in Bangladesh <laughs> and um, so, <laughs> so there are problems you know they're, they're, if, if I want to give the home office any credit for anything then um, I will say yeah um, it, 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 this isn't always there are problems here on, on, on our side too um, but uh, yeah, so, but in terms of change in tract, um, the, one of the things people always ask me if I think this was deliberate and I don't think it, I, I mean, a lot of it's historical. So the people who are sat in the home office now, and you know, I work very closely with them. I sit on their Windrush advisory group, you know, some decent people there and, you know, but, but, um, but head in sand often, they don't understand the nature of the cohort. But what I think though, I don't think anybody sat in a room and said, look, we're going to reduce net migration by, you know, these little old grannies that came off the boat in 1940 something. I don't think that happened. But I think, though, when you look at the recalcitrance around the resistance and how they've resort responded, it's almost as though they're not frightened of us at all um, in the way that they would be, say, if this was a Jewish community or the Muslim community or some other group that's organized. You know, there's a you know, you've got a board of deputies or you've got your council of Great Britain, there is no such equivalent. And I know the Windrush uh, scandal doesn't only affect the Windrush generation, it is Commonwealth. And that includes white Commonwealth. I've got clients, white clients from Canada, I've got one from New Zealand. There's not just, but overwhelmingly it is, and overwhelmingly it's Caribbean, um, Jamaican in particular, you can keep dividing down the subset. And, um, you know, there isn't any representation, there isn't a strong, powerful voice or an organisation. And we had some wonderful speeches by some of our members of parliament, but they're busy and, you know, once the camera's off, they go back to doing the other work that they have to do, if I 
want to be generous to them. Um, and 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 so and then you know I, I'm not knocking them at all because you know we work with them behind the scenes on things and we achieve stuff through them. So so they and some of them are better than others. Um, but what is how is that political track going to take place, or, or, or what form will it be in? We do a lot of work with the media. Um, I don't necessarily like the way the media covers this, you know, intrusion into people's lives and making everybody look downtrodden and depressed. And a lot of people are suggestible. So they tell the media stuff because the journalists, you know, I've spent a lot of time with those journalists and they're very good at getting information out of you and, you know, and, and sucking you dry. Um, and, and people tell them things that I, I personally don't think they should. Um, you know, so it's a problem. It's a real problem area. But at the same time, every time there's a story in the media, that person gets justice somehow, you know, which is why I suspect Trevor Donald will get citizenship very shortly because they hate it. I mean, when you go to meetings at the Home Office, they always say, well, what's that bloody journalist saying this time round, you know? It's the one thing they hate. And it, funny enough, all the stories about Pretty Patel being a bully, um, you know, she does actually go in and scream at them when something's in the press and, you know, gets, a, a, and I'm not, I'm not saying you should ever go around bullying anybody, but, um, you know, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's on their minds how the perception is, because it's the one thing in migration, even though the Oxford Migration Observatory just recently found that the figures were, had gone down as to the number of people who thought there should be no migration. Um, I can't remember, that, but it was it was quite a shift, at least a 12 percent shift. Um, and, and that's really quite important, you know, because the previous report was pre Brexit. And so we know that Brexit was framed with xenophobia and racism and then the 2019 election pretty much the same way. And so people, you know, there's no votes as far as they're concerned, there's no votes in it. But 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 but, but my, in Windrush was treated very differently, you know, because the whole country across the country, you know, when you saw those headings as headlines in the Daily Mail of all papers, you know, um, they realized that it touched the hearts of the nation. Whether it's for the right reasons or wrong reasons, you know, people thought all these little people, we feel sorry for them, they came here to build up Britain and brought us spice and all that sort of stuff. You know, you hear all these weird stories when you listen to the popular radio phone in programs. Anytime I appear on one, I always listen to hear what people are saying afterwards. And you hear really strange narratives about who this Windrush generation are and what our purpose is in this country. But nevertheless, it's quite important to under understand how people are thinking and what it did. It was to make it unifyingly, um, you know, support. There, there was support for the Windrush generation. That support has held. Um, whereas, you know, if you want to deport 20 Jamaican men, nobody really bats an eyelid apart from a few of us, uh, you know, or refugees sinking in the channel, you know. And, uh, there are growing numbers of people who care about these issues, though. And then... Um, Halim, so Kalwinder, I think, was next. So, so interesting, your question, um, and interested about your research. I'd like to know more about it. Um, yes, we do see that. So it all depends. I mean, as you know, one of the stories of Caribbean families was that they left some children behind in the Caribbean until they were economically settled. So children came. And even in my own family, on the Jamaican side of my family, I see families that came in, in a staggered way, you know, when the family got a bit wealthier, they sent for the children who were left back behind with grandma. And then some were born here. Some were born in Jamaica, but came here pre-71. Some came, well, 73, and some came afterwards. So you see all kinds of stories in one family and children having very very different status um so you're absolutely so i have seen it i've seen it outside of windrush i see it a lot you probably saw the story in the news of the two the twins um well, so there was another sibling in that family who had status who was only nine months younger than them had status but the twins had no status where they should have had status, but they had none. And then the Home Office was trying to deport them to different countries because one parent was from, from Grenada and one parent was from Dominica and they actually gave them removal directions or, or you know, for different countries. It's, it's, it, you see really odd things, but I, I just want to, caution, I'm conscious of the time. I just want to tell you very quickly about how this manifests itself in a really horrible way um, of three brothers who were Grenadian brothers who were convicted of, um, the same offence. They, they, they were attacked and they live in one of these shires, it's one of these middle class areas where there aren't many black people and they all had white girlfriends and went to a nightclub one night and uh, Bouncer wasn't very happy with them coming in with their white girlfriends. I think it was one of their birthdays and there was a fight and uh, it got brutal and, you know, 
my client had, you know, they they laid, they resisted and, and, and the fight was bloody. Um, and so they got, anyway, police arrived and they all got charged and they all got sentenced um, to a few years as co-defendants, three brothers co and a friend, all co-defendants of the same offence, same crime um, for GBH. And, um, and then coming out of prison, after serving, they got sentenced to four years, which those of you here who practice immigration law will know that's a kind of magic number, four years. Um, two got no, they had no involvement with the immigration of the Home Office, and one did, and one was facing deportation. And it turned out that although they all, so, so two were born here, um, but one was born before the parents were married. And the parents had actually tried to get him registered as British, but there was some, something wrong with the paperwork and the application was sent back and they didn't do anything more about it. But the other two got, got through and were registered as British. And so the consequence of that family or for that family was that three brothers, two are here, co-defendants in the same offense, were able to stay and one got deported, got deported to Grenada and he's left his house his partner, his parents. Not only were his parents, his father came in the 1950s, his grandparents were here as part of the Windrush generation. So it's something we're looking at. Um, it, you know, so you do see massive injustices um, all the time. And it's mainly because of the pattern of migration for some Caribbean families, which meant that they staggered when their children came or when their children joined them. And some have never been able to come, which is part of what that judicial review on uh, the CUKC status might um, might have some, uh, some some traction over, but I think it's going to be very unlikely because you could then end up in a position where there's people who've never stepped foot in England who are entitled to come. And I think with the flow, although they've not had any issues, and I'm not being divisive here about people from Hong Kong, because right. I get lots of colleagues telling me, oh, Hong Kong people, why are they allowed to come? They should be allowed to come. But you, but you know, the, but 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 it is an issue that people haven't bought so much about the numbers because it's a potential of five million. Although the media says three million, there's a potential of five million. So if there are people in the Caribbean, it isn't going to be anywhere near that. And if they should be entitled to come, they should be entitled to come. These historical anomalies do need to be sorted. And Halima, such an important question, very very important question. Um, I see lots of people who come here and seek uh, asylum. Um, and because of the system, and you probably um, saw the obituary of Majid Hassan in the Guardian, um, it was in the Guardian in February, but for some reason it's um, only just sort of gone around the social networks this weekend, um, who the most horrendous, from Dafur, the most horrendous story of him applying for asylum and his family, and he got, you know, his wife got killed and his child, and then he went to Dafur to bring, he got married, remarried, and and, and she got, she died, although I think that might have been in childbirth. And then he went there to bring another child over and he got killed. Um, and you look at his, the, the narration of his seeking asylum and the disbelief and the suspicion and how inhumanely his application was treated. It says, I, I, as I said, when I tweeted about it, it's a masterclass on how um, the lack of sympathy or the or the or, or, or the lack of humanity in our asylum processes, and we're seeing that now with the people who are in Napier barracks and and and, and the conditions that they've been living in, and the fact that the, the Home Secretary was told, you know, that you can't house people in that way because of COVID, and did, and seventy people at Napier, uh, you know, were contract contracted COVID. You have all these problems, um, and and his story, as it's fresh in our minds, is a really important one to read because it sums up exactly what you're saying. Mental health is such an issue. If you're going through those conditions, you are going to suffer mental health. And I, particularly not so much now because I don't do much asylum, but when I was a solicitor at Bernbergs and I did some, I saw cases of uh, people who had come here, got, particularly from Somali community, I did quite a few of those cases. And my colleague, Liz, I don't know if she's still here, um, does a lot of asylum cases with Somali community um, at Bernbergs. We saw, um, you know, mental health issues leading direct to getting involved in offending. And then the, and I see now, I've got a case now with a young boy from the Congo. When you look at his offending and the nature of offending, there's a direct link between his state of mind and what's going on in his life. Um, and then they 
end up in the deportation proceedings. Now, just to say, Halima, that I don't know who, if the Home Office told him he could come back in five years, well, it's usually 10 years and it's actually usually never. If you get deported, I, I, you're not coming back. So I wouldn't, um, you fight to make sure they don't go in the first place. And that's, that's really it. I wouldn't believe, I wouldn't take any notice of, any, of anybody telling me, you will go now and have a holiday in Somalia for 10 years or wherever he is, I don't know which country, and he'll come back because he won't. We don't get entry clearance. We're going to continue to fight because he's really mentally ill yeah. and he's in a mental hospital in Holland at the moment. He tried to burn, he tried to kill himself, but he survived these specific bones. And I thank you so much again for having the time to answer this. I, I, I'm sorry I'm taking too much time, but I really appreciate it. I want to say one thing to Halima, though, that if you're continuing to fight, that's a good thing. And because look at, you know, the case of N. I don't know if some of you would have seen it. Um, woman uh, who uh, was deported to Uganda wrongly, and when she was there, she was raped. Um, and uh, she was brought back through the work of Movement for Justice. As I said, I mentioned them earlier on in another context, a group of women who campaign. I don't know if I'm not seen, I can't see all the names. I don't know if they're on here today. I did send it to them, the link. Um, but there are um, organizations who fight and people do come back. So if you've got a case, I I'm saying it's very difficult to, to come back and it's certainly not the Home Office's mindset to do that. But if you've got a high profile campaign, um, you should keep that going. Great, thank you so thank much. You. So much, so much, Jackie, for answering all of those questions. And, um, and Halima, you know, that you face such a hard struggle um, with your family, it's, it's, you know, and for sharing that with us. Thank you for that. And so many people are actually going through such tremendous agony, um, almost torture, really. This is really nasty what a government is doing to our people. And I wondered whether we as CLS will start to maybe step up our political action, um, maybe take it a new direction. Um, I like the idea of amnesty and also, you know, we need to be speaking to our Caribbean leaders about what role they will play in all of this. Um, I'm always reminded of when um, May was having the Commonwealth heads of government and the Caribbean leaders were here and she was refusing to meet with them because they're actually going to raise the questions of reparations and they didn't want to hear it. But when the Windrush scandal broke, um, she suddenly found time to see them. Um, and we need to really put more pressure on our Caribbean heads of government to do better representation for the citizens um, or for the people who've come to this country to live and contribute so much to its development and certainly deserve a whole lot better treatment than they're getting and we need to find ways to solve this problem. So thank you very much, Jackie, and you've answered so many questions. I'll give you a chance to have a breath now. Um, and I think there's one question Steve wanted to ask, or we've got a couple of um, issues coming up. Usually our executive and members will make announcements. So I will ask for announcements with any meeting coming up, anything that's um, due to happen that we should know about. And um, I'm not sure if Paul is in the, on the, in the audience and if Paul will give a report from Jamaica. It's customary that Paul will give us some little update. Um, and so I'll just leave it. I think Steve, you had a question. So I'll, I'll leave a, a question for Steve and then um, we will go on to reports. Yeah, my, uh, all, I wanted to, all I wanted to say was that uh, I live in Waltham Forest. Uh, Melanie Strickland is a neighbour of mine. And uh, I think the, the action of the Stansted 15, who have just recently been acquitted when they chained themselves to the bottom of a plane uh, to, stop, uh, to stop a deportation flight, uh, has been very important. And it was particularly important. People mentioned the role of trade unions. It was particularly important, uh, certainly locally, in winning the support of local trade unionists uh, for the campaign, because you know, here was a local woman who did something quite courageous uh, 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 and, and, and was potentially going to be prosecuted for it. 
And I think that, uh, that that was what really brought it home to our local trade union council that then was able to, you know, and, and we did our best then to support her and her comrades. So I think did a remarkable thing uh, of uh, risk, risking a lot to chain themselves to the bottom of a deportation plane. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that. I, I knew there was some name to it, Steve. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, we've got Bentley has been trying to get a question in, so we let Bentley in in a moment to, um, to put his question or comment. Um, but I also wanted to, yes, just reiterate, Steve, that you know the trade union movement can make a huge difference to the struggles, and we need to support them. They've been not so good in the past; they're getting better. Certainly, we at CLS feel well supported by Unite RMT is done very good work around reparations and continue to fund and support. Um, we've been had access to actually having a big meeting place to the trade union, trade unions, and we've got some really good comrades in the trade union movement who are progressive in terms of um, racism and around reparations in particular. Okay, Bentley, you get your chance to come in now if you've got a question. Steve, would you let him in? Thanks. Bentley, you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, Bentley, you need to unmute. You need Is that to... it? That's it. Okay. It's me and Marcel Scully from Birmingham. Just want to ask a question. Mine is very simple. I get, uh, I hear an, a lot of discussion about the, the problems and woes of the wind resting. I've been to several meetings and so on. What really worries me, and I'm known as Jackie can clear this up, is that it seems to have gone to include people who I don't consider to be Windrush. Yes, right exactly. About people from Niger right about people from Nigeria and Ghana. And we, the, the Windrush people were those West Indians, the English-speaking part of the Caribbean who, like myself, born there, came here at 11, and I wasn't a citizen of Jamaica. There was no citizenship. The only citizenship we had was British. And it was when the hostile environment was launched, not in my opinion, as a former lecturer in public administration. I, when I read the text and the policy document, it wasn't leveled at West Indians or these Windrush people. But what was not done, the civil servant did not make the policymakers aware that there exists in this country a group of people that are ring fenced against this deportation. So the civil servant was up with, we can go into that all day. The other thing was a group, an organization which no one is mentioning, and they're escaping. They're the, culp they're the main culprit. They, um, UK border force. They were the ones that was implementing and carrying out the Windrush arrest and so on. And they identified this group of people without any documentation to prove their existence here. These group of people, the Windrush were the low hanging fruit that they focused on. Thirdly, just what Luke said, at no time in the independence consideration did the governments in Barbados and Jamaica and say, we need to look at what will happen to these Jamaicans, these Barbadians, these Grenadians who have emigrated before independence and are likely, what problems are they got? So it's a kind of faulty, we can blame Theresa May, we can blame Pat Pretty Patel, but there is the UK border force, the civil servant, the Caribbean government or West Indian government, that all, if you look at this thing in that context, in that political arena, deficiency, and, you know, is, is there all wrong, Marcel? Yeah, two quick, two quick yes or no to the sister. The Nigerian authorities, have they published anything pertaining to the work that's been done by the British authorities so far? The Nigerian authorities, have they published anything so far in respect to the work of the British authorities? Yes or no? Okay, thanks. Okay, um, oh, sorry, Luke. Yes or no? 
Shall I take the whole question or? Yeah. No, just yes or no. I didn't. Nigerian authorities publish anything. I don't actually understand what you mean. Not, Have no, they published anything at all as, ever? As far as the Nigerians, as far as the Nigerian is ago, the Nigerians and their problems with with, with the situation. Have okay. they published? Let me the let me let me link let me link the because that comes into the question that the person sat next to you asked. So let no, me no, just no, do. No, 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 no. Please, can you answer me? Yes or no? Yes or no? <laughs> let, let, let me in here, Steve. Can you hold up a right. minute? Right. Are the Nigerians? It might not be a yes or no answer. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's not a yes or no answer. It's not a yes or no answer. So, um, um, it's not a yes or no answer. But I will come to it. Um, the, so, the border force is actually now. It, it's so the border force has gone through many different names, and now we deal with the Home Office. It's split into different bits. Um, the, we, the bit we are dealing with mostly is UK VI, UK visas. Um, so that's just language. Um, and when we keep referring to the Home Office, we are referring to them as they are designed now and as they've been historically. So we don't need to get hung up on that. You're absolutely right about low hanging fruit. That was in a speech um, that was made. And that's why people um, talk about a conspiracy um, because the Windrush generation were referred to in an official document as low hanging fruit. Um, so you're absolutely correct. In terms of independence, when you search the archives and you look at the discussions, the, the transcripts and the, um, what's the thing called when we, before fax, was it telexes um, that people were sending backwards and forwards? Well, firstly, all the constitutions were written in Britain anyway. Um, that's the first thing. And I think they used the sleight of hand. I don't think the legislators in the Caribbean actually knew what was going on. Um, but those constitutions actually took away status from people. It actually said, you're now Jamaican, you're now Guyanese, you are now Grenadian. It's actually in those constitutions. And some of them went further to say you couldn't have dual nationality. So Trinidad and Tobagonians can't ha couldn't have had dual nationality until the 1990s. Um, so you, in, in one sense, when you're looking at this, um, this, this matter, you've actually got to look country by country, um, constitution by constitution, what were the discussions going on between Whitehall and the legislators in those respective countries. And it's very interesting because different things apply to different people in different places. In terms of um, the Windrush generation, um, yes and no. Um, it's a mute point. I don't, I don't know what it is about this point that Caribbean people like to kind of hold this as their little baby, you know, don't, don't mix us up with Nigerian and Ghanaians. And I find that a little bit difficult for me, really, because it kind of brings up some kind of ism that we shouldn't be having in this era. Um, however, the Windrush, calling this thing the Windrush scheme is, is a mistake um, because it isn't about um, the Windrush boat and it isn't about the Windrush generation. Members of the Windrush generation have been caught up in it, um, but it is about people who came from the Commonwealth, in particularly the Black Commonwealth, because you know also under ancestral visas and all sorts of other complex bits of law, you find that people from New Zealand, Canada and so on were able to avail themselves of status um, through ancestral rights that we can't or Black Commonwealth people couldn't. And so that's why so much less of them are involved in this, although they are caught up in it as well. But the Windrush scheme is actually open to everybody. So a very large number of Italians and French, you know, people from Southern Europe who've been here from the 60s and 70s have gone through the scheme and managed to pick up you know, citizenship for free without going through the whole um, to boodle off the permanent state, you know, the EU settled status scheme and permanent residency and all that sort of stuff. I was not bothering with any of that. They've just gone straight to Windrush scheme and said, we want citizenship and they've got it. And that data is available. So, um, so it, it's, it's so complex, but you raise something that's really, um, really, really quite interesting about um, the institutional ignorance, um, because that, that's really, you know, you're right to say um, that when the, so when the hostile environment was coined and when the, we've seen memos and minutes about this, um, it was very, it's very clear that it was about, and I mean, that's in the media as well, so it's public, that it was about unlawful migration. Well, that's what it was determined. I mean, although 
you know, the um, National Audit Un uh, Office has said that, you know, it hasn't, there's no evidence that it was successful in doing what it was supposed to do. But what it has done is to snare people who are here lawfully, i.e. members of the Windrush generation. So, you know, it was had this uh, unintended or depending on where you stand on the conspiracy rector scale, intended <laughs> consequence of bringing into it uh, people who it wasn't aimed at. Um, and that's where we saw the reference um, to low hanging fruit um uh, in those documentation so that so so there was some there was some evidence that they kind of knew that there was a problem and weren't addressing it and as i said the caricom high commissioners when we had that training seminar in 2015 um dominica wrote to the home office about this issue and literally saying you know can these people just be given some sort of documentation without having to pay for it i mean it was at that level but it was this issue. We hadn't, we didn't think of it as this issue. We didn't even call, the word Windrush never came up at all. But the Windrush scheme is a misnomer as using the word Windrush. It is open to everybody in the country who's been here from 1980, before 1988, or who was here on the 1st of December, 1st of January, 1988. It's also um, open when when you're looking at the period because there's bits there's different segments of it so when you're looking at the period before the 1st of January 1973 it's open to commonwealth so that's all commonwealth I think the home office were grappling very early on for a label for it and labeled it the Windrush scheme and it is one of the reasons you so the gentleman who asked me about whether the Nigerians have published anything well I don't know that I'm not an expert on Nigeria I really don't know the answer but the Nigerians have been involved because they're very concerned about the large numbers of their people who are being refused returning residence visas. And there's a lovely woman called Ngozi. I thought she was gonna be on this call, but I don't see her on it in this conference. Um, Ngozi, um, who works with Windrush Lives and who is Nigerian herself and has been taking up cases of returning residents who are stuck in Nigeria. I've had a couple of those cases, but she's the sort of, she's the person I'd say is the expert. The Home Office themselves, um, have been trying to target people, organizations in Nigeria, Ghana, and in various countries in Southeast Asia, where there's been a low take up um, on the view that people from those communities are saying that uh, they don't think that their, their citizens who might be affected by this know about it sufficiently. And whereas the high commissions, the British high commissions in the CARICOM region have had road shows and open days and all sorts of things, there hasn't been any such thing in the African Commonwealth countries or in the Asian Commonwealth countries, and there needs to be. Um, so, so there's quite a lot of work doing this. This is multifaceted, multi-layered. Lots and lots of people are involved in addressing this. Great people are involved, but what we mustn't do, we mustn't be divisive because I get that all the time. I mean, I, I even fell into a trap where, um, you know, the EU settled status groups, 90 community groups were given uh, nine million pounds to spend on giving advice uh, for the EU settled status, you know, for their residents and Windrush, no, no groups had anything. I mean, they've just announced a 500,000 pound fund, which we had to fight to get back because Priti Patel took it away and gave it to a cross part, a cross government working group. And we said, no, not a bit of that. Um, that money was earmarked for Windrush groups. So the Windrush advocacy groups around the country are now able to bid for up to 25,000 pounds to do some work and no, not legal work, the work they've got to do with it is community engagement. So don't want to put any money in the hands of lawyers um, to do this work. And they're actually saying to the people affected by the Windrush scam that you don't need lawyers to do it. But yet, if you look at how complex it is to do, especially a compensation claim, um, we've got Glenda on this call and she will tell you the form itself is nothing. You know, the form is 20 pages, but the guidance notes are 96 pages. There's complex um, narrations and 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 uh, stats and, and and maths that you've got to do, um, and big big problem that I find myself really bogged down with, and I'm working with over 200 people is evidence. You've got to put your claim together. You've got to evidence your claim. You've got to substantiate your claim and do it in a way that you maximise it. And so it's not an easy piece of work to do. And, and also, you know, the Home Office have just recently lowered the standard of the burden of proof to a balance of probabilities, but that was just in December. Before that, we were working to a higher standard and people we're talking about documents going back to the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, people haven't got. And so they deliberately set up a scheme that people couldn't access. There's no access to justice. There's no legal aid. 
it's the only scheme I know of, and I've worked on other schemes. It's the only scheme I know of where there's no funding for people to say, I want to go to my lawyer and get this done. And that's why you've got these lawyers out there saying, well, we'll do it for you, but we want a percentage. And some of them are very good firms, but they're charging a lot of money um, to do these claims. And they are a lot of work. So I understand that, but it's unconscionable. That somebody who gets £100,000 compensation should have to give 30000 of it to a lawyer. It's very wrong. But that's what's happening as a result of the way the scheme is designed. Well, thank you very much for that, Jack. It's amazing that they can find so much money to support the Europeans um, in making their claims and nothing for the Caribbean people. As a matter of fact, what the initiative is probably to do to try and divide us if we can squabble amongst ourselves. Um, that we will not be effective. Let's, um, Bentley, um, I, I see you trying to come in. You've got just like half a second to make a comment. Um, I think we're running out of time and fast, so let's be very quick. Thank you, Steve, for letting Bentley in again. You there, Steve? Okay, like Steve is... Bentley's on yeah, mute. Steve. I think he's talking, but he's not. That's the perennial problem with the mute button. Yeah, press, press the, unmute yourself, Bentley. Okay, right. As the Ghanaians publish a document, <laughs> publish a response. As the Ghanaians publish a response. Yes or no? They may have done. They may have. I don't know. Right, right, right. I can find out. Um, I can. I work very closely with my colleagues in Ghana and Nigeria on this issue and the diplomatic call here too. I can ask them for you, Bentley. Right. Okay. No, 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 no. The, the, my they have got Marcel. things on their websites. They, they have for me. No, my they have name got is things. Marcel. Oh, Marcel, I'm going to make a note. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Right, right. The last they one, have... the last one, the last okay. one, the wholeness government, the wholeness government in Jamaica, have they published a current document in, in, in their tracking of the situation? The Hornets government, have they published a, a current document in their tracking of the situation? Um, Marcel, could I just ask, are you wanting to get hold of these documents? Is that what you're no, interested in? No, just answer man. Just answer oh, you just want, just you just want to me. know. Have, have, I can't, document, I, I, can't document. I can't speak for the Jamaica Prime Minister's office at all, but let me so tell you. Don't let, know. you don't know. I don't know. No, I don't know. That, that would be the fairest thing for me to say. I don't know. But what I'm saying is that they do a lot of work on this. Just two weeks ago, I did a training session for the... Uh, diplomatic corps, the Caribbean diplomatic corps, and it was organized by the Jamaica High Commission. They're constantly writing letters to the Home Office. There's been a complete turnaround in that office because um, once upon a time you contacted any of them and I was actually related to one of their High Commissioners and I tried to get her to um, do some work around some of the immigration issues that we were facing and they weren't interested, you know, especially if you've got the JLP representatives in there, um, they just weren't interested. But um, we have seen a complete turnaround now um, so much so that I can tell you they have been doing the most sterling work behind the scenes on uh, deportation, um, which has shocked me because, you know, we were, I, I took part in a picket outside the High Commission because I was so outraged that they weren't dealing with the issue or responding or using the powers that I think they've got. But they, there has been a turnaround. I think Luke is going to tell me to shut up in a minute. So okay. before I do it, I, I before I go, um, I just want to sort of, um, I, two protocols I didn't observe at the beginning properly. I didn't um, thank Francisco Domingo for his, um, uh, for his great speech on uh, what's happening in Latin America um, and particularly with Venezuela. Um, that, that was really um, interesting to hear and an area that's very dear to my heart. And the other, protocol breach was to salute somebody who's on this call. Well, there's a few people on this call, but somebody, although I've mentioned her name many times, um, but Glenda Caesar is on this call. Um, I don't know why I keep calling it a call. We're, we're picking up a whole new language around <laughs> online meetings. I'm not even sure what I'm talking about half the time, but this is Zoom. Um, and Glenda, you would have probably seen in the news quite a lot. She has been a champion of the Windrush scandal um, and an amazing advocate who I'm sure she won't mind me saying before she found herself caught up in this position probably hadn't actually spoken to the media or anything before but she has been amazing and I think a lot of the changes that we have succeeded in getting to the scheme has been as a result of her work and I would like everybody 
to, and there are some other um, really great people on here. And I can see that um, Liz and Andrew Madden are on here who are also um, affected by this. Um, but I'd like us all to unmute for a minute and just give Glenda a big hand because she has done so much of our work for us. <laughs> and for you, Jackie, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Glenda and Jackie as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I will be wrapping up in a few minutes. I did promise Dana to have a few minutes to update us and give us some information. Um, and then I will do a closing thank you to, to everyone. So just hang in for a couple more minutes with us. We're now running past the time we scheduled to go. So please, um, Dennis, will you come in now? You wanted to? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, a short while ago, uh, trade unionism once more proved how effective it is, how effective it is when workers um, combine and use their joint efforts uh, to win. Uh, you will be aware that um, there are a number of minicab drivers in London and across the major cities of the United Kingdom who are using companies such as Uber and so on to undertake their work. These uh, drivers, and I was one for a short time, um, are very, very precarious in their employment conditions. And the union, the GMB, has used its power and has used the work of leading members of the trade unions to win a case in the Supreme Court. Um, it was on the news for a little while, but it has phenomenal significance for workers working under new technology. And it is going to affect not just minicab drivers, but also workers in other sectors of the economy. And the Supreme Court gave a unanimous decision that companies such as Uber have to pay minimum wage. They also have to provide uh, holidays and they also have to provide other conditions which they have denied. So when I heard earlier someone make the point that the work of the trade unions was crucial, here is an example. And of course you will know that the uh, members of the Supreme Court are not, don't belong to some lefty organization. These are very conservative people, yet even they now realize that the way workers are being exploited has gone too far. And just in closing, Luke, um, I'll say this to comrades who believe that um, we're special. Um, a number of complaints have been made that we are the Windrush generation and we shouldn't have been affected by the um, machinations of the Home Office. Well, here is a concrete example of believing that you're special and finding out that something comes back and bites your backside. What should have happened, as Jackie has said, is that the organizations that we have got in this country that are um, Caribbean, and there are hundreds of organizations should have been on the ball and should have challenged the Home Office in a very vociferous way. And frankly, they were caught napping. And they thought, well, it's gonna to happen to those immigrants, the ones that we see you know, on boats and so on. It's nothing to do with us because after all, we speak English and we're British, aren't we? And here it is, it's come home. Um, what I would say to everyone is join organizations, whether it's your trade union or organizations such as CLS, join, participate and contribute. And through that, you will get great strength and we will defeat future efforts that is going to come our way. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dennis. Okay, all that's left for me do now, to do now is to, to, to wrap up the, the, the meeting. Um, I say thanks to the speakers, especially Jackie, who spoke for such a long time and took so many questions. Thank you for your energy and your information that you've provided. It's not been so useful to me and I'm sure to lots of the listeners and the viewers. Um, now we hold a meeting the first 
Sunday of every month, we want to invite you, the new people who have come to this meeting, the people who have been coming on a regular basis. We look forward to seeing you every time at our meetings. Um, we haven't quite um, decided on what our main speaker will be doing on the next um, meeting on the first Sunday of April, um, but we will send the information out. Visit our website to get information. I think this is being recorded, so you can actually check the chat to get information. Some people have put information about the things they're doing. Um, we're very much interested in knowing what you're doing out there and want to support you know, whatever action you're taking to make our society a better place. We certainly will be in the, in the struggle for reparations um, for all times um, until it's paid to us and until we get an apology and we need you to join us. We can't really achieve anything without you. You know, if we've got numbers, we've got a chance. As Hilary Beckles, you know, who's been at the forefront of the reparations movement in the Caribbean has said, you know, you know, who are you? If you don't have power, you know, just go away. Um, so the only power we've got is you, our membership, um, and how much you might be prepared to come out and be, make a voice and make some noise about the things we're doing. We produce an, uh, a newsletter, which is called Cutlass, which um, please look out for. We will try and get it out every two months. Um, and I want to, in closing, wish everyone a happy International Women's Day, and especially the women who've joined us. Um, it's a very special day tomorrow. We would hope to, to call in to uh, make a contribution in talking about the life of um, Phyllis Gord, who went through so much in Grenada and whose imprisonment, you know, amounted really to torture, you know, if you've read her book, and it's an amazing book if you haven't seen it. Um, and I know that there is also going to be a launch coming up soon of um, Bernard Cord's book, um, so you will look out for that. Please um, stay connected, visit our website, and you will get um, more information about the things that we do all the time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And, Thanks again to Steve for conducting this meeting really well in the background. Um, Omar for tweeting and doing other things you're doing out there. Okay, everyone. Bye and see you next month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you very much to Jackie and Francisco. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so, so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.